Welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Laura Lee Blanchard, founder of Leilani Farm Sanctuary. Today we're talking about the sanctuary. So let's get started. Tell us about your life before the sanctuary. I was working in the corporate world where my days were spent in high rise office buildings. I was the senior vice president of a commercial real estate brokerage firm. And um, it was about as different of a lifestyle as this. And um, after many years of working in that industry, I became interested in cat rescue. So in the evenings, after long days of business meetings, I would go and rescue cats in the evenings and um, ended up adopting more and more cats. Well, my cat rescue work led me to the Orange County People for Animals, an animal rights organization. And it was then that I learned about factory farming, and other species of animals and was introduced to um, a vegan lifestyle. So that was about 26 years ago. Uh, and then what finally forced or just kind of inspired you to make the transition to what you're doing today? Like, how did you pick up and move? It was a bit of a gradual process started looking for farms in California, which is where I was living, Northern California, Central California, and wasn't able to find a farm with the right amount of acreage. And then one day we learned that the Hawaii had reduced its quarantine requirement for cats. And at the time I had 11 cats, so that was very important. <laughs> It, it would have been a deal breaker otherwise. So um, decided to come out to Hawaii on a scouting mission. And I was very fortunate because this property was not even on the market. There were no properties on the market that had acreage. And this one was soon to be on the market. And we learned about it and made an offer and the rest is history. All these years have passed. Wow. And when you say we, who's we? That was my former husband. Oh, okay. <laughs> He's back in California now. Mm -hmm. So did you, you know, after, did you, did you think you just were going to quit, essentially? Or were you first planning to find a job? Oh, um, or... well, he... Uh, when I married him, he was a medical doctor, general practitioner, and um, he realized at the beginning of our marriage that practicing medicine didn't suit him very well. What he really loved to do was remodel houses. He liked construction and mm -hmm. um, workman, um, craftsmanship, woodworking. So during the years that I was in the corporate world, I was the breadwinner, but he made a significant contribution by adding value to our house with the construction skills that he had. So um, before moving to Maui, I took a consulting job with Farm Animal Rights Movement based in Bethesda, Maryland, and worked as their national communications director. So when I arrived on Maui, I was still able to do that. I was able to work remotely just as I had when I lived in California. So that's what I did for the first few years or so. Mm -hmm. And then how did you end up acquiring the animals that you had? Was that always the intention that you were going to have a farm sanctuary? I never intended to have an official farm sanctuary that wouldn't have been an acceptable plan to my then husband. <laughs> our plan was to just have a few of our own personal animals. So as I said, we came with the 11 cats and then we heard about a couple of um, very tame hens who needed a home. So we took in the two <laughs> hens and he built like an aviary for them. 
and then year or two after that, we received a call about a couple of newborn baby goats, twin goats, and they were teeny tiny, about the size of a cat, just hours old. Mm -hmm. Their umbilical cords were still wet. Wow. Hunters had killed their mother, so oh. they were orphans. So this was the first time I had ever experienced having baby goats, and oh boy. I don't think there's anything cuter than a baby goat. <laughs> and we had them in the house with us. So of course, they had to wear diapers. Wow. And they were bouncing around. They, you know how goats like to jump on things. They're mm -hmm. propelling themselves off the bed and they're busting out all their diapers. <laughs> so we had to put little um, infant um, pajamas on them and, <laughs> and safety pin their pajamas to their diapers so they wouldn't bust out of their diapers. <laughs> They were so cute. That's wonderful. <laughs> and then how did you, I mean, when are they usually weaned from their mother's goats? Like how did you, did you get goat milk? Oh, well, we had to bottle feed them around the clock. Wow. Um, well, I shouldn't say around the clock. They slept through the night. They're, they were sound sleepers. They slept on our pillows. Didn't make a peep all night. <laughs> yeah, they were, they were um, two little black goats, boy and a girl, Mary Kay and Bobby. <laughs> And uh, they were they were easy. They were so content to be in the bed on the pillows. Mm -hmm. And during the day, they'd drink their bottles. And while they were drinking, they'd look straight up and make direct eye contact. Wow! And they were so warm and soft and super tame because they were imprinted so young. So they they loved to be carried around and mm -hmm. just absolutely adorable. Yeah. Was it hard to move them out of the house eventually? I mean, now that they're so used to being in the house, or the, do they still come inside a lot? Well, that was um, that was like 23 years ago. So oh. <laughs> they're, um, unfortunately, they're no longer with us. They exceeded, they, they fit, completed their lifespan. The mm -hmm. average lifespan for goats is 13, 15 years. Oh, okay. So they've gone to goat heaven. But um, to answer your question, they actually loved when they graduated to the outdoors. Yeah. Because they could graze and mm -hmm. run around. So they, they didn't mind not being in the house anymore. Yeah. And most importantly, they had each other, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. makes all the difference. Yeah. Why, why did you have to have them inside at first? Well, um, <laughs> couple reasons number one we didn't have a barn we didn't have a fence paddock for them they were our first farm animals so we didn't we weren't set up for them to be outside also when they're that young it's good to keep them warm and since they need to be bottle fed all the time it was easy to have them inside yeah so just kind of convenient how about the other animals? How did you acquire some of the other animals, like the animal that the farm sanctuary is named after? If you could show oh. the picture, Eric. Leilani, yes. <laughs> Leilani was living in a pasture, and one day um, the neighbor who was friends with Leilani her name was Sue. Sue would go over there every evening at sunset and hang out with this donkey, bring her an <laughs> apple, and they became best friends. And she'd bring her brush and she'd brush the donkey. And one evening, Sue learned that the property was going to be subdivided and developed. So Leilani was to be sold at an auction, livestock auction. Uh -huh. And um, she told me about this. And uh, my husband and I went for a bike ride to visit her at the pasture. And it was a huge pasture. And when we pulled up, she, she looked like she was miles away, but we called her name. Uh -huh. And she responded. She let out a big, loud bray and came <laughs> running to us. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. So... We made arrangements to bring her over, and um, that was she was the namesake for the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And then, how did things evolve after that? 
Well, uh, my husband started getting tired of building fences and doing things involving animal structures. What he really wanted to do was find carpentry and work on the house. Yeah. And um, it just wasn't the lifestyle that he wanted. So um, he decided to move back to California, but it was a difficult situation because we co-owned this property. Yeah. And I didn't have any savings to buy him out. This was mm -hmm. this is like uh, 2008 when the market crashed. Yeah. And we had a lot. He, he was investing our savings in the stock market. And in the early years, he made a fortune, which was how we were able to get to Maui. Mm -hmm. We were at one time millionaires. Mm -hmm. but it all evaporated with a crash. Yeah. So by the time my former husband decided to move back to California, we were pretty much broke. And I was in a bit of a bind because here I have all these animals and he's entitled to his 50% share of the equity in the property. Yeah. yeah. So it was really touchy there for a while, but... In the end, I found a couple who was interested in co-owning the property with me. So that was the plan. They were going to co-own it. They were, and um, we built a cottage in the back of the property where I would live, where the animals are. And the couple would live in the original house. Mm -hmm. their, their lawyer, though, convince them that co-ownership was fraught with problems and okay. advise them not to do it. So they said, if you want us to buy the property and you um, live here, you can have a lifetime lease. So that's what we ended up arranging. So my former husband got his equity mm -hmm. and now I'm here for the duration of my lifetime. Mm -hmm. So they still live on the property then, this couple? The wife, um, Sarah Taylor, who has been a speaker for the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, mm -hmm. um, she just a few months ago died. She had glioblastoma, a brain tumor. Yes, she, she was very young. She was the author of um, the book, uh, Vegetarian to Vegan. Yeah. And vegan vegan in 30 days mm -hmm. so pretty tragic yeah that's but her husband mark is still here mm -hmm. he's he's also a medical doctor ophthalmologist oh really yeah i mean i'm um that makes me sad but anyway um i was wondering how about the other animals i know you have a few pigs as well um, yes um we we have 16 different species of animals, and they have come under all different types of circumstances. We have deer. The deer all came as orphans after their mothers were killed by hunters. Um, the picture you just saw in the screen was our duck pond. We have many ducks, geese, swans, and and um, turkeys. The turkeys were both saved from being butchered for Thanksgiving. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and they have convinced so many visitors to rethink what they're going to eat for Thanksgiving because mm -hmm. visitors come and the turkeys love to be hugged. Yeah. So the visitors can squat down and hug them. And after hugging a turkey, it's kind of hard to want to consume a turkey. Yeah. When, you, when you realize what affectionate animals they are. Yeah, they're beautiful animals too. I think turkeys yes. are beautiful. You don't realize, you know, they have beautiful feathers and it's really- They certainly are. Yeah. Uh, so how about those roosters that are crowing in the background? Oh, we have lots of roosters. <laughs> um, many were saved from cockfighting. Mm. In fact, I went into a cockfighting operation in the middle of the night and kidnapped a bunch of them. 
Good for you. <laughs> that must have been dangerous, though. <laughs> yeah, it was. They were tethered by their legs, and I brought my scissors and cut the tethers right off their legs mm -hmm. and whisked them away. And as as you know, cockfighting is illegal in Hawaii, but it's still rampant here. Oh, it is. It's I think it's. I think it's because the crime is classified as a misdemeanor rather than a felony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's too bad. It is rampant here. I had some next door neighbors actually who were actually keeping these roosters in kind of like a little cage. And we suspected, I mean, why would you want to, it was just weird, you know, it wasn't like there were animal lovers or anything. And so we knew that they were just keeping them for cockfighting. So well, next time I go to visit you, I will liberate those roosters. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, now what happened is my husband got very angry at them because the rooster was making noise every day and waking him up. So he went over and he yelled at them. So, you know, the roosters were liberated. <laughs> so excellent. Yeah. So we have like a liberated roops rooster now just roaming about. <laughs> Yay. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So that's what happened with that. But uh, how about the pigs? How did you acquire the pigs? Oh, uh, we we have um, we have one pig named Bernie who came to us as a wild. He was a young wild boar living in the gulch, mm -hmm. just on the other side of the property. And he decided that he wanted to be friends with the donkeys and the other pigs here. So we. We were worried about him being in the gulch with hunters and yeah. dogs. So we we um, had him join our family. That was many years ago. And we have another pig named Charlotte who yeah, Charlotte. was living on a pork. Do you remember me and Charlotte? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She yeah. was living on a pork farm where they were raising pigs for bacon, sausage, ham, and um all the things that you turn pigs into. And she escaped with her whole family. She was just a young piglet at the time. Okay. And the whole family was living right in the brush of Bahama Highway. And hunters spotted her, okay. the whole family, and hunters started shooting at the pigs. But they got arrested for firing guns so close to traffic. Oh, good. They should be. I mean, that's really dangerous, too. Yes, it is. But they returned the next day with snares. And unfortunately, Charlotte got caught in a snare. Mm -hmm. But before the hunters could retrieve her, a rescuer came along and saved her life. So she's here now, and safe for the rest of her life. And um, just last week, we received 16 guinea pigs. Oh, really? Six yes. 16. So many. Well, what's happening is now that COVID is receding and school's back in session, mm -hmm. parents are taking the kids' guinea pigs to the shelter. Oh. And so there's a huge overpopulation. They're surrendering guinea pigs at record rates. So the Maui Humane Society asked if we would help. And a lot of guinea pigs are here, and they're just having the greatest time. Yeah, and they get along. You remember? Do you yeah, remember them? them? Yeah, I remember feeding them the cats. Yes. <laughs> and they love the cats. The cats go in and hang with them. Mm -hmm. The guinea pigs have little two-story houses, and the cats go in and snuggle. It's really mm -hmm. sweet. Yeah. So now we've got maybe 40 guinea pigs. Oh, my gosh. And they're so happy because they get to exercise. They're out of cages. They get fresh air, sunshine, organic veggies and fruits. Mm -hmm. So they're happy. So I forget what you said, you know, what you do with the eggs of the chicken because you don't want to support animal, um, you know, animal husbandry or whatever. Because um, I remember when we visited, you know, the chickens lay eggs, but I don't remember what you do with them because... Well, um, some people ask us if we sell them, and we don't. And that's because we do not consider eggs a healthy food. They're loaded with cholesterol, and as you know, animal protein feeds cancer cells. So um, we don't do that. But we do have friends who rescue um, pigs 
who hard boil the eggs and feed them to the pigs. And that's perfectly fine. Yeah. So that's what we do with our eggs. Mm -hmm. Even though they're cruelty free eggs, they're still um, not anything we're interested in eating. Yeah, no, it's definitely not good for you. People don't realize how much cholesterol an egg has. So, yeah. So how about uh, visitors? Tell us about, you know, visitors. How can they come to visit the sanctuary? Visitors come and attend our farm tours. We have farm tours three times a week and they get to see the whole farm. We take them around and they get to meet all the different species of animals. They get to um, feed carrots to the tortoises. We have African sulcata tortoises and they get to brush the cow and brush the donkeys. We have sheep. It's very interactive. They get to go into the aviary and hold the chickens. So the farm tours are one way for people to visit us. The other way is a lot of people on vacation come and volunteer. We have volunteer days twice a week. Nice. And so that's really fun. And after they do- What do the volunteers do on the volunteer days? All different projects. We often give them a choice. You know, might be gardening, it might be grooming the animals, it might be collecting the eggs. And um, if we have room on the tour after the volunteering, they can join us as nice. our guests. Nice. Well, that's, I mean, have people come and have you seen some people come through the sanctuary and then kind of change their mind about eating animals and consuming? Oh, yes. Food? And it's the best news I can possibly hear from people after they visited to learn that they've decided to stop eating animals we hear it all the time mm. and you have to figure that for every one person who tells us there may be 10 others who don't who yeah. we never find out about yeah that's true i mean i guess people i mean what would you like people to know about farm animals now that you have so many that people might not realize you know just normal everyday people who might not visit the farm sanctuary just how personable they are. They all have individual personalities. They have distinct voices. I can tell all my chickens apart by their voices. I can <laughs> every cockadoodle, every cockadoodle do is unique. Um, the goats all have different voices and they're, they're really smart. If I stand in front of a herd of goats and call out the name of one specific goat, just that goat will answer. For example, if I say Nancy, <laughs> just Nancy will go, ah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Freddie, Freddie won't answer and Anthony won't answer, but Nancy knows her name. They all do. So um, I would like people to know that farm animals are just as sensitive and capable of feeling as our pet cats and dogs. Absolutely. People don't realize that. I mean, how about um, the cow? I mean, how did you guys acquire the cow? Oh, Dorothy, thank yeah. you for asking. Uh, Dorothy was living on a ranch where she was being used as a milk cow. And when her milk production waned, the rancher decided that it was time for her to go to the slaughterhouse. But one of the workers on the farm, this guy, a farmhand, had developed a really loving relationship with Dorothy. And he could not bear the thought of her going to the slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. So he offered to pay his boss whatever amount of money the slaughterhouse would give for the cow, which was about $500. And the boss said, okay, but what are you going to do with her? <laughs> and... Um, the guy said, well, I'll just have to find, find her another farm. So he called up all the farms on the island, and nobody wanted a cow who wasn't a commodity. If she's not a milk producer and we can't slaughter her, why should we have a cow? Yeah. But then he found us, and we were ecstatic to finally be getting our first cow. Okay. We had held out for a rescue cow, mm -hmm. and we'd been operating as a sanctuary for so many years without a cow 
Yeah. And so um, we got Dorothy. And um, in the end, the rancher did not dock his worker's paycheck. Mm -hmm. And the worker came several times and visited Dorothy, fed her bananas. And um, she was really afraid of most people because she hadn't been well socialized. Mm -hmm. But now she just soaks up the love. Visitors brush her and hand feed her and she's totally mellow. That's wonderful. I mean, what a difference that makes, you know? I mean, how can people, I mean, I know you also wrote a book. So um, I wrote a book called um, Finding Paradise, and it's about my um, journey from corporate America to the farm, mm -hmm. and it's full of a lot of drama, <laughs> and it can be, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. If you go to our website, there's a tab that says book, our book, and our website is uh, www lailanifarmsanctuary.org, not calm, org. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Lorelei. Um, we're out of time, but we have to wrap oh. it up. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, so, but, you know, really loved having you on the show and um, just going to wrap it up now. Um, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking with Lorelei Blanchard from the Leilani Farm Sanctuary. Thanks to you all for being here. Thanks to Eric, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of our crew at ThinkTech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you on March 31st for more of Healthy Planet on ThinkTech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. Our next show will be about Hawaii marine life with Kiyoki Stender, scuba enthusiast and avid photographer of marine life. If you have any ideas for the show, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com for more information on my projects, including future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Thank you.